Digital platforms, um, they, of course, we all know that, and that I assume to be some sort of, you know, common phrase, but they have created enormous benefits and very powerful global connections. Let me say that first of all, because I, may, I know, is there anyone in this room who has not been using one of the big five platforms over the, let's say, the past week? You must have been on vacation to some kind of remote area where they don't have, we are not connection, there's no connection to the internet or something. So anyway, we all know how much we have become dependent on these platforms. But since 2016, problems have been mounting for the tech companies. And we, you probably have heard about the tech lash, which has introduced that sort of, you know, mounting problems. We have been talking about disinformation and fake news a lot. Hate speech and trolling was much into the news. Um, we have heard much about the election intervention, particularly the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal. Uh, it's probably still fresh on your mind, but that, as if that wasn't enough, we have had privacy scandals, we've had security leaks, and of course, totally different venue, we've had tax evasion and undermining of labor laws. And that, now I'm just stopping here because you would be totally depressed before I even have to start the lecture. There's lots about, you know, addiction, etc., etc. My conclusion so far would be the long-standing values that promote an open society, and by that I mean tolerance, democracy, fairness, I will come back to that, they're compromised in the online world and that's a world that is dominated by mostly American digital platforms. So my leading question today will be, how can we anchor public values in an open digital society or all the open digital societies in Europe? Pretty much how could we use data for the public good in an online world that is almost entirely dependent on a private American ecosystem of platforms? I will come to that. So over the next 40 minutes or so, I will take you through these four uh, uh, speaking points. This is sort of an outline. I will first explain to you what I mean by platform ecosystems, what I mean by public values. We're all talking about public values. What kind of values are they? Who are responsible actors in this digital society? And what particularly are the challenges of Europe? Uh, uh, Toby already pointed to that. Now, let me begin by explaining to you what platform ecosystems are. How do they operate and how do we encounter them in the wild? Pretty much in our global online world, you know, that is a world that is driven by platforms and those platforms are fueled by data flows. Now, platforms and data flows can be steered by companies, either companies or states. And the two platform ecosystems that dominate the online world are what I call the American platform ecosystem and the Chinese platform ecosystem. And of course, squeezed in between the US and China is this continent. And this, our European continent, has pretty much no major platforms. This one is the only major European platform in the global top 50. Anyone? Guess, can guess who did, which one it is? Spotify. Yeah, Spotify. Actually, on that top 50 of uh, uh, most important platforms, it's number 49, so it's not that big. But more importantly, it's no longer fully European. Tencent and Sp uh, Spotify have now minority shares in each other, and it's, Spotify is actu actually listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So. In short, for online infrastructural services, Europe has become largely dependent on the American platform ecosystem. And here you can read that this was actually, these numbers are from last year, the corporate headquarters of the largest players by market capitalization, they're very unevenly spread geographically. 47% located in Asia, 36% in North America, and 15% in Europe. And the most important thing is that of those 15% plat, uh, platforms in Europe, Europe has very few unicorns. Estonia has Skype, for instance, but that has now become Microsoft. Taxify has become a, quite a big one, has become a, unifor, uh, a unicorn. It's now owned by Volt, it's now called Vo, uh, Volt. And AdGen, which is a Dutch company that is a pay service, which you may probably not know, but those are pretty big platforms. 
The problem is that neither of those platforms have important infrastructural positions, and I will come to that in just a second. When we talk about platform power, it's very important to distinguish the various levels of platform power. It's actually distributed at three levels, and I compare that to a tree, just to stay in kind with the ecosystem metaphor. We have the roots, which is pretty much the internet architecture. It's the digital infrastructure of hardware, of ISPs, internet service providers, but also satellites and data centers, domain names. It's the big infrastructure that the whole tree basically relies on. Now, this part I have not, we have not included in our research. It was just too much, because we have concentrated on the middle and the upper part of the tree, and that's the trunk and the branches. The trunk, by that I mean the, uh, the infrastructural intermediary platforms. I will come to that in a second. And secondly, I will concentrate on the branches, which is pretty much the sectoral platforms. I will explain that to you in just a second. Most importantly, most important about this uh, slide is to remember that these, the big five company uh, ownership is now distributed both among its roots, the internet architecture, as well as that intermediary level, as well as the sectoral branches where it's spreading its powers. Okay, so this is just a visual to remind you or to remember when we talk about platform infrastructure. It's a hard thing to imagine, but I try to make it more clear. In the GAFAM, American GAFAM systems, um, American platform company, uh, companies are driven by, you know, not so well, of course, by market value. In terms of market value, the big, these big five, they form the world's fifth largest economy after the US, China, Germany, Japan. But more important, I think, more important than market value, it's about societal power and influence. These big five increasingly act as gatekeepers to all kinds of social, economic, cultural, and personal online traffic. And that's what you also see in the branches. So our focus has been on the, the trunk and the branches and how, those, uh, in, how these, these two interact, the intermediary and the sectoral platforms. Let's start with those intermediary infrastructural platforms. How do the big five company, uh, uh, companies actually wield those strategic platforms? And by that, I mean we have in, made an inventory of what those infrastructural intermediary platforms are. We have, uh, we have found some 70 that we would call infrastructural, but that's disputable. For instance, social networks like the Facebook Blue app, but also, uh, of course, any other social networks. Uh, web hosting, pay systems, identification services, cloud services, advertising agency, search engines, of course, operating systems, navigation maps, messenger services, app stores, analytic services, and there's about 70 of those. Now, societies across the globe, and particularly also in Europe, they have come to depend on this infrastructure for organizing all kinds of societal sectors, right? So, and rather than having private infrastructure, uh, public infrastructures, we increasingly see that platformization also means privatization. Now, there's a big debate whether um, we should call these, particularly intermediary services, these infrastructural services, whether we should call them utilities. And because they have become privatized, that's a huge debate. I'm not going into that because it's pretty much a legal debate, but it's actually very difficult for lawmakers to define which platforms are utilities or infrastructures and which are not. So that's an incredibly refined you know, legal debate. Now, each of those platforms, well, the whole platform ecosystem, in fact, is built on commercial values. They're driven by market forces, the market forces of efficiency, monetization, and of course, dominance, because it's all about marking market dominance. But what about public values? That's what I stated in my initial questions. What about public values and the common good? Now, Europe, different from America and from uh, China, on the other hand, has substantial public sectors and public space, which pretty much seems to be absent from the American ecosystem. 
And public values appear to sit in tension, and that's why we've had, I think, those problems over the past few years. They sit in tension with the commercial values that structure GAFAM's ar architecture, the trunk particularly of the platforms. Now, first, before we continue talking about public values, what are we in fact talking about? What kind of values do I consider to be important uh, public values? First of all, those values are um, very basic values that pertain to our online interaction and online society. Values like security, transparency, accuracy, and privacy. We've heard much about that. You may expand this into values like autonomy, very basic human values. And these values, of course, they're not fixed. You're not, you can't go, just go to a store and you know, pick them off the shelf and buy them like they are. Values are often negotiated, and they're negotiated at different levels. For instance, when Google tries to implement its, pla its uh, educational platforms in schools, what, we're s what we see happening is that privacy, the value of privacy of students may sit in tension with transparency. And that transparency may be a very valuable uh, public uh, notion because, for instance, schools could be opening up their data on children's progress to the public or to research. So those values may uh, sit in tension and needs ne need negotiation. But beyond in, you know, those precise values, beyond internet and consumer values, there are public values that pertain to society as a whole. And those values, they're not exhaustive, but they include fairness, inclusiveness, responsibility, accountability, and of course, democratic control. And these values are negotiated at every single level starting with the transnational level at Europe, at the state level, the local levels, but also at the institutional level, you know, all the way down to the professional codes that, for instance, teachers or journalists have anchored somehow in their societal, in, in how they perform their societal roles. Interestingly, or perhaps sadly, connective platforms often bypass or ignore those you know, sectors, those, where those values are negotiated. For instance, institutions or professional codes. They go straight to individual consumers. I was just talking about education. What we're seeing is that individual schools are being offered uh, Google Apps for Education and even uh, Chrome laptops at very you know, low prices, 150 bucks, which is way underpriced. But that's, of course, because Google can earn it back in other sectors or through other uh, 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 services. Facebook, for instance, it bypasses news organizations because it refuses to carry the label media company, and hence it ducks regulation. So public values have become increasingly important, I think, not just to our European system, platform ecosystem, but to the entire world. And that brings up the bigger question, who is actually responsible for the platform society? You know, these public values, as I said, they don't just exist, they need to be negotiated at every single level. Um, the very simple answer to this question is, we are all responsible for governing the digital society. But analytically, and this is sort of you know, a lesson I took from um, Political e Economy 101, analytically, there's three types of actors, market, state, and civil society, right? In China, as we just, see, uh, as we just saw, state actors dominate. In the US, <coughs> excuse me, market actors dominate the stage. In Europe, ideally, there's an emphasis on civil society and state actors in balance with market actors. So, in fact, you know, there's a few simple rules in, in Europe. Data are preferably owned by their citizens. That's why we put so much emphasis on privacy. Um, European nations prefer to operate in multi-stakeholder organizations, so, you know, to balance off those three different uh, societal actors. But there's three problems with implementing public values in the European platform society. First, those civil society actors, they're systematically underrepresented in the ecosystem, and particularly in the infrastructural um, part of that ecosystem. Second problem, there's hardly any public space in the American platform ecosystem, hardly any to come by. 
And the third problem is that data, um, you know, generated mostly by civilians, by citizens, by uh, users or uh, buyers, those data become mostly proprietary, so they cannot be used for the public good. So those are three major problems we, are, we have to deal with. We need to articulate value-centric principles at the European level. And now, this could be many different sort of principles, and I totally agree if you say you can't do that just top-down at the European level, but that's not what I mean. I, by a few principles, I mean very you know, simple principles from which nations and local authorities and institutions uh, where they can actually look up to and say, okay, that's what we stand for. And then they can start negotiating uh, those public values themselves. So what kind of principles would, could those be? For instance, about data ownership. Very simple rule, four words, data belong to citizens. And that, of course, has everything to do with privacy. But, you know, the, the, uh, on the other hand, open data belong to the public. And by open data, I mean that there is reciprocity between those, you know, who open up those data, and usually after that, they're becoming privatized, as I just showed in the educational world, by those companies. Re open data reciprocity means there's, it's a two-lane traffic, right? So that could be a very simple rule. Data portability. You can carry data around to different platforms. Very simple rule. We could have that at the European level and then work it into the various other you know, levels of implementation. Data transparency. Data flows could be regulated like money flows. We all you know, found are perfectly comfortable with the fact that banks are being uh, looked upon as you know, they are, are in control of data flows and states are actually controlling through accountants, for instance, how those data, data flows are governed. We could do a similar, implement a similar sort of governance with data flows. Why not? We just have to you know, be inventive. And finally, software ownership. Open source when open source is possible not simply you know, privatized by default, but if you put up open source as a viable alternative and also support it, I think that would be, make a major difference. I think many of us, especially you know, people in Europe who have been complaining about American platform companies a lot over the past few years, I was one of them, if we feel squeezed between those two ecosystems, made in China, made in the USA, it's time to rethink our own architecture, our design, and the governance of platforms. Indeed, as I said, we're all responsible for creating a fair, open digital society. And by all, I mean, I don't know how many there are in this room, but engineers, I mean policymakers, I mean regulators, I also mean academics like myself, but particularly also civilians who care for the society they live in, who want to govern it democratically. I think we all need to collaborate on design and on governance of these platforms. The current tech clash, as I've just been describing or in the beginning of my talk, that tech clash doesn't necessarily lead into a dystopian future. I refuse to believe that there is necessarily, this brings us into some kind of dystopia. And I see very encouraging signs coming from public counterpower. In the online world, we see many local initiatives, for instance, taken by the city. I'm now involved with several of these initiatives in the city of Amsterdam, several cities in the Netherlands, uh, with uh, public broadcast systems and a lot of public uh, organizations who want to collaborate and uh, provide alternatives. We need those initiatives and need to support civil society efforts also raising awareness at both the national level and the uh, supranational level. And I really believe over the past year, um, I think actually after we fit, had already finished the book, so it, I'm so sorry I couldn't put it in anymore, but I really believe there has been more awareness and more consciousness about what non-profit civil sector, uh, uh, civil uh, society actors could do on this level. So. On closing with that hopeful note, uh, there's certainly a lot of hope in that area, and the idea of platform counterpower will hopefully be the topic of my next book. So I will leave you with that thought. <laughs>